Thank you so much, Azam and Hallelujah and the whole team at Or Deposits Hub. I'm, I'm really excited to give this presentation. I, I think you're doing such an amazing job over there, connecting people from, from everywhere. And, uh, and so congratulations on this initiative. Um, I'll just move to my first title slide. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to thank Geoscience BC who sponsored the project that I'm going to be talking about today. And in addition to that, I want to thank MDRU's foundation members. You can see them on the bottom of the slide here and all of MDRU's members for supporting MDRU. And finally, my co-authors, I need to send a huge thank you to my co-authors, um, uh, Dominique Fournier, Craig Hart, Thibaut Astic, Devin Cowan, and Robert Lee. This was a very much a collaborative effort and, um, and it, it took every single one of these people um, to bring this project together. So I, I guess there's probably a lot of people that are, that are tuning in that are not familiar with these organizations that, that you see here and that I'm mentioning. So I thought I'd just, first of all, get a, give a bit of a background on MDRU, UBC GIF, and Geoscience BC, so that you know where we're coming from. Um, I work at MDRU, I'm a research associate there. Uh, the MDRU is the Mineral Deposit Research Unit of University of British Columbia, and it's a collaborative joint venture between the minerals industry and the University of British Columbia, and it's focused on solving mineral exploration related problems and training highly qualified people. UBC GIF is a UBC Geophysical Inversion Facility. And so this is a, another research unit within Earth and Ocean Sciences or Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at UBC. And it has made major contributions towards the development of forward modeling and inversion algorithms for potential field and electromagnetic data. And then Geoscience BC, the group that uh, sponsored this work, they're a nonprofit organization they generate independent public geoscience research and data about British Columbia's minerals, energy, and water resources. And this advances knowledge, informs responsible development, and encourages investment and stimulates innovation in British Columbia. And they've supported me actually on numerous projects in my career. So big thank you to those um, organizations. And, and the Technical Advisory Committee, which is made up of industry and, and and acad academic, academic um, uh, groups, as well as individuals that, that um, decide on which of geoscience species proposals go ahead. So thank you also to the, the TAC for geoscience BC for supporting this project. Okay, I'm just, here we go. So also I, I assume that I don't know, know many of you that are listening. Um, basically, I'm just a geologist excited about geophysics. So I, I started out as a geologist, um, started working with rock properties and geophysics as part of my PhD, which was also which was at MDRU. At UBC, I called my PhD my Shania Twain phase. It was work in Timmins, which is Shania Twain's hometown. And in fact, I did a, a geology tour in Timmins one time that involved touring the boulders, the decorative boulders that surrounded the Shania Twain uh, Center in Timmins. <laughs> so that was really amazing. And so after that, I, I, um, uh, I've been glommed onto geophysicists ever since, basically. Um, some of these pictures just show in, from my PhD. Um, I don't know if Nigel Phillips will ever view this, but he was working with me at UBC and also at Mira Geoscience eventually. And he slung all of this equipment on me during my PhD. And uh, I got to take electromagnetic measurements in the field. And, and that was really neat to do. And after that, I did a, a whole lot of rock properties stuff for a postdoc, uh, rock properties of porphyry deposits. And, and so that's me in the bottom with my magnetic susceptibility meter, just taking tons of magnetic susceptibility measurements at a bunch of different mine sites. And yeah, I just, I just love using geophysical data to understand the geology of um, bedrock geology where we basically, where we can't see it. And it's just really fun for me and integrating geophysics with other available uh, data, geological data. And I'm really happy to know a bunch of geophysicists that have been extremely patient with me and, and guided me through a lot of my 
problem solving and uh, and they haven't yet blocked my calls. So that's really great because <laughs> I call them a lot. Okay, so this presentation is sort of an extended version of a presentation I gave at the um, Association for Mineral Exploration, uh, British Columbia Roundup, which is in Vancouver every January. And so that presentation was quite local and um, benefited really local um, audiences that are exploring in BC. And so I, I hoped to um, make this presentation a little bit more general so people can take away some of the ideas and apply them more generally to their exploration. But first of all, just the, this locally, the things that you might be able to take away from this talk is that in British Columbia, there are lots of, there's lots of potential for porphyry copper gold. And the map here just shows, um, it's the geologic terrain map for British Columbia. And it's essentially a bunch of volcanic arcs that have been amalgamated onto um, the North American continent. And that those are shown in the greens coming down. And you can see I've highlighted all of the, um, the major porphyry deposits. Some are past producing, some are producing, some are just uh, advanced development. And the blues are, calc alkalic style porphyries, the greens are alkalic style porphyries. So you can see there's a lot of porphyry deposits in British Columbia. British Columbia does provide a lot of copper um, uh, for Canada. And um, a, an issue is there's a lot of glacial cover, glacial till and an overburden in parts of British Columbia. And so that's hindering exploration in places. So can we see through this to locate new porphyry targets in central British Columbia or elsewhere in British Columbia to provide new information um, or information on uh, existing porphyry targets? So that's sort of the local picture takeaways and then sort of more big picture, generally applicable things that I hope that some people might be able to take away from this is what can be learned about deep and undercover geology from different geophysical methods that we used. What are the geophysical footprints of porphyry host rocks at a regional or district scale? So that's kind of the scale that we're looking at. Um, what are physical properties of porphyry host rocks? And just to get an idea of the methodologies that we use and, and sort of our multidisciplinary team approaches. So I'm hoping that everybody can take away a little something from this, whether local or regional or global. So this was my slide at Roundup, what's hiding in central BC? And this is basically classic central BC, just a lot of trees. <laughs> and uh, so what's hiding there? Sasquatches, lots of Sasquatches are hiding in there, very elusive beasts, but they're there. Or porphyry deposits. So that's the a uh, schematic drawing of the Copper Mountain porphyry deposit uh, geology. And so, yeah, there's a good chance there's some more porphyries hiding in there as well. So the premise behind this project that was sponsored by Geoscience BC um, was that we have this porphyry prospective mineral belt with a large 250 kilometer gap in mineral occurrences at its center. So this map here, um, first of all, this is where we're located in Canada on the West Coast in British Columbia, basically central British Columbia. And the white outline is showing the project area, the location of the project area. And then on the map here, we have in uh, black outlined the project area. And the reason why the project was focused in that area is because, well, we've got the Mount Milligan Porphyry copper gold deposit sitting at the northern end of that, Mount Polly sitting at the southern end of that. And we've got a whole pile of um, porphyry occurrences and showings and, and um, prospects north and south of that. So the, the yellow diamonds are alkalic style porphyry deposits and the white circles are more the calcalic style porphyry deposits. So I should mention this is this is in the Quinell terrain. And so this is a very um, uh, porphyry perspective belt. Um, the reason why we've got in here this really empty space with, you know, this is essentially like no, very few to no mineral occurrences. This is not, this is not actually, you know, it's a bit, a bit of a 
uh, um, falsehood because there's likely occurrences sitting in here, but we've got a lot of overburden. There's just not been enough exploration done because of this this overburden here, and it's 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 difficult to get around, and people um, are assuming that it would be you know tough to tough to drill and 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 to hit your targets and things like that. So there's not been much exploration compared to northern and southern Cornell terrain. So what can we do to help explorers that want to work in this area better understand the bedrock geology so they can, um, so we can help sort of guide their exploration in this area. So one thing we can do is look at geophysics. And Geoscience BC supported by industry recognized potential in this region and conducted two uh, large scale geophysical surveys as part of their quest program. This was around 2007 and 2008. And on the left here is the uh, an electromagnetic survey that was done. So this is centered basically over the same project area you saw on the previous slide. And quest is the, the Q part of that is stands for Quenell. And so we've got the elect a huge electromagnetic survey that was done and a huge gravity survey that was done. And these two surveys became the jumping off point for a lot of really great studies, um, including um, geological and structural in interpretation studies, um, inversion modeling studies, 3D modeling of this uh, geophysical data was done. Uh, mineral potential mapping, several workers did mineral potential mapping in this area. and. Uh, so there's been some really great work to try to help understand the bedrock geology here and to come up with new targets and to sort of spur exploration and try to find those missing porphyry deposits in there. And basically there's, there's actually still lots of opportunities for this data. It's an incredible data set. And we are in fact using it for this project and um, to model the overburden thickness and also to come up with some porphyry targets. So the project of objectives, and it's essentially the outline of this presentation, was to identify a suite of regional scale targets that look like porphyry hosts. And we did this mainly using magnetics, but we also um, took a look at the gravity. To model overburden thickness, to get a sense of um, you know, feasibility of, of exploring these targets. To model the porphyry targets using geophysical inversion to try to understand their physical rock properties and their subsurface size and shape and depths and distribution. And to assess the prospectivity of these targets based on geophysical characteristics, overburden thickness and other data that we had available. Okay, so first of all, picking initial targets. What are we targeting? So we need to, to kind of come up with a, a plan. So we decided to focus on the alkalic style of porphyry deposits. So these are porphyry copper deposits that are derived from alkalic magmas. And we decided that um, we we're gonna look for ones that were similar to alkalic porphyry deposits related to late Triassic alkalic intrusions in the Southern Quinell terrain. So this is a map of the Southern Quinell terrain. So this is just below the project area. You can see the bottom of the area of interest outlined in black. And so south of that region there's much better um, bedrock exposure and this people have been able to map this area and, and to develop ideas on, on on the geology and structure in this part of the quenelle terrain um, and so there are four magmatic belts that are understood to occur here and one in, in the dark pink here so we've got this purple one, this dark pink and light pink, and then a blue. You can see the four different belts there. This one in the dark pink is this late Triassic alkalic magmatic belt. And it's interesting uh, because there's several important porphyry deposits associated with these the intrusions that are part of this belt, like Mount Polly, New Aft, and Ajax, Copper Mountain. And some of the other things here are, are more um, occurrences, porphyry occurrences. And, um, and you can see all of these actually, they continue on up into the central Cornell terrain. So there's every reason to think that these belts might exist in part, or at least some of them to some degree through the central Cornell terrain. 
Um, alkalic deposits are often, well, they're gold rich, they're, they can be PGE rich. Um, so that makes them very interesting. But, but really what spurred us to go after these ones was that they seem to have a common geophysical footprint. So that was kind of made it a little bit easier to um, look for geophysical targets when we have something that seems to have a consistent geophysical signature. So that was a big reason why we decided to look for these in particular. What is the geophysical footprint of allocalic porphyry hosts? Um, and so this at a district regional scale, I'll add in the Quinell terrain of British Columbia. <laughs> so, so this could be, you know, maybe this applies um, to other places. In fact, alkalic um, porphyry deposits are not that common around the world. They're, they're um, well recognized in British Columbia and in New South Wales, Australia, and a couple of other places. Um, so they're, they're, they're not the most common type of porphyry deposits. Um, so what we did was look at rock property data and also geophysical data in the areas of these known porphyry um, intrus intrusion host rocks to see if we could figure out what the sort of footprint of these of these host rocks were. So with the physical properties, we collected some samples and 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 measured rock properties on these samples and um, combined that with a lot more data from the um, rock property, Canadian rock property database. Um, so we can, took all of the Quenelle data out of there um, and added it to our own sample database. And we looked at specifically the magnetic susceptibility and density data and, and just plotted them to see if we could see if there was sort of a way or if it was possible to, distinct, to distinguish um, intrusion, intrusive rocks from other rocks that exist in the area. So plotting up, so this is just sort of the domain where this, the majority of samples sit in that space. So on the, on the um, x-axis, we have density and the y-axis, we have susceptibility. And um, so this is the felsic to intermediate intrusive rocks. And they sit sort of in a higher magnetic susceptibility, low to moderate density region. And then these stars represent samples that have come from intrusions hosting um, por known porphyry deposits. So they kind of span that space. And then we have volcanic rocks. There's some overlap there, but a lot of them do sit down in, and th these include sort of massive volcanic rocks, uh, volcanic sedimentary rocks. A lot of them do sit down in the lower susceptibility space, slightly higher density. Ultramafic rocks, gabbros, things like that are higher density in general. They can be similar susceptibility. And then sedimentary rocks are usually lower susceptibility. So what we're looking at here for felsic to intermediate intrusive rocks is higher susceptibility, lower to moderate density. So that's kind of our petrophysical footprint. And just another interesting trend we saw with the felsic to intermediate samples is that there's this increase in density when you go from more cyanitic, and I know this is not like a direct line in, in lithology, but when you go from things that have less iron magnesium mineral lower iron magnesium mineral content to things that have a higher iron magnesium um, mineral content, we get higher densities. So just keep that in mind because I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to this a few times um, in the coming slides. So then we looked, like I said, we looked at some data. Um, so we have this large compilation magnetic data set for Canada. It's a 200 meter gridded data. And it's pretty good for looking for things at this regional district scale. And um, so that's what we were looking at um, when we checked out the, what the signatures were for other porphyry host rocks intrusions in, uh, in southern Quinell terrain. So this is the new Afton and Ajax again, and they sit in the iron mass batholith. The Copper Mountain deposit sits in the Copper Mountain stock. And these are overall magnetic they have contained magnetite and are magnetic. 
And then we have gravity data. So, so Geoscience BC also commissioned a gravity survey in the Southern Quinell terrain below the, those surveys that I showed earlier. And so we can also look at the gravity data. Now the gravity data is coarser than the magnetic data available, but that, that um, survey um, generated a much higher resolution gravity data set than what previously existed, which was um, sort of a 10 kilometer uh, grid. And so in this case, we had 200, uh, sorry, two kilometer um, line spacing. And so we had much more detail in this gravity data set. Um, same with the, the central Quinell terrain. Um, it added a much higher gravity resolution um, to that area. So for the iron mass batholith and the, and the copper mountain stock, these things are seem to be moderately um, have have sort of a moderate gravity anomaly. So I'm assuming you know hot, moderate density rocks. And and these things are monzonitic to to diuretic hosts. So kind of um, makes sense. So looking at a few more deposits. So again, the Mount Milligan that's at the top of the area of interest. So that sits here, it's on, it sits in some um, monzonitic uh, stock. And with Mount Milligan, so there's this big magnetic high, and this sort of spans from this monzonitic stock to this cyanitic, large cyanitic body to the north. And this su suggests, the magnetic data suggests that these might be linked at, at depth. Now this is not map, mappable at surface. But um, so there's, this suggests a link. Um, this has not been shown to be genetically related, although speculated. Um, so either way, we've got this big intrusion here. It's a magnetic high. Looking at the gravity for Mount Milligan, we have got a gravity high. So that's consistent with what we're seeing in the Southern Quinell terrain. Then Mount Pauly, which is at the very bottom of the area of interest that we're looking at, this sits in these cyanitic to monzonitic to diuretic intrusive rocks. And again, we've got the magnetic high consistent with what we've been seeing for alkalic porphyry host rocks, but it breaks from the trend here in that we seem to, seems we have a gravity low again, this is fairly coarse data, but so in part, this might be related to, there's this stock down here, it's called the bootjack stock and it's cyanitic. And it may be like, as I was showing before, the cyanitic rocks have lower densities out of all the intrusive rocks because of their lower iron, magnesium, mineral contents. And it's hard to say that Mount Pauly for sure is, is um, the Mount Pauly igneous complex, which is what the Mount Pauly deposits hosted in, whether that's a, a gravity, a moderate gravity high or, or a low, hard to say here with this data. It does seem to be a low. So that one's breaking from trend. Um, and I'm gonna actually come back to that towards the end of the talk when I do some arm wavy things. <laughs> um, anyway, we've got this thing where it looks like we've got magnetic intrus intrusive hosts and mostly you know, moderately um, dense host rocks. So this in fact here is a little bit arm wavy, but these are some other things we can look at to pick initial targets size and spatial relationships um, in addition to geophysical response. So late Triassic alkalic intrusions spatially correlate with early Jurassic calc alkalic intrus intrusions. And I'll just highlight. So these are the early Jurassic calc alkalic intrusions. And then that's another magmatic arc. And then there's these alkalic intrusions. So in some cases they're up against each other and, and in other cases they're close or they're aligned and it's just kind of an interesting spatial relationship. I don't, I don't really understand. I, there may be people that understand more what's going on there, but um, there's this sort of interesting north, south, regular north, south spacing along the, um, the arc, which is quite interesting. And then, you know, it's, you, it makes you think, is there some kind of shared structural control on these intrusions as they're coming in? So that we kind of kept that in mind as we we're picking targets as well, this sort of regular spacing and clustering. And then these contrasts in size and in gravity response. So you can see the alkalics in red. 
those intrusions are much smaller. They're about five to 15 kilometers. And then the calcalcalic ones are quite large. They're up to 30 to 50 kilometers. And then the alcalic intrusions have more of a gravity, um, a positive gravity response. And then the calcalic ones are usually gravity uh, lows. So moving on to picking the targets. So these are the targets that we pick that we, that we go through the process of um, further understanding their feasibility through looking at the overburden thickness. <clears throat> so basically what we did was pick sort of three areas um, that we focused on northern project area, central project area, and southern project area. We picked 57 targets. And basically the criteria were that they were magnetic, they were of the a size that were similar to known intrusive host rocks, so five to 15 kilometers, and that they looked intrusive. So that was important that they weren't, um, that, that they were sort of cross-cutting other features. So you can see some more elongated um, magnetic highs here, and that's probably volcanic stratigraphy. That's um, where the volcanics are magnetic or contain magnetite. So we tried to pick things that look intrusive. And you can almost see some of the clustering here in the central part of the Quinell terrain as well. So in the northern section, we call this the Fort St. James block, sort of a trend to the northwest. And then we got the central area. And there's more almost like a, a perpendicular to the arc trend. And then in the southern area, so this is the Prince, Prince George block and the southern area is the Quinell block. And then we kind of have that Northwest trend, which is just the structural trend of the region anyway. So we picked these 57 targets. And so now backing up a tiny bit, um, in order to try to understand whether these targets are worth exploring further in reality, um, we tried to understand how thick the overburden was above these things. And um, basically, uh, the VTEM survey that was that was commissioned by Geoscience BC, the data and the models that came from that provides really useful insight into the extent and the thickness of superficial cover and bedrock. But which is a, also really it, it actually does tell inform a lot about bedrock and structure. And I and I hope someday to pursue that avenue as well. It's it's um. It's a really useful data set for, for a lot of things. <clears throat> so um, the VTEM inversions, uh, there were inversions that were done by Mirror Geoscience in, um, in 2009, eight or nine. And there were 85 lines. So these were stitched 1D inversions. And so these are conductivity models. That's the result of the e electromagnetic inversion. So the reds are conductive material and the blues are resistive material. <clears throat> so they're 85 lines, four kilometers apart, and they show conductive overburden. And um, it's sort of this thin conductive material at the top. And that we were able to look at existing data, such as the exploration drilling data and water well data and outcrop data from BC to confirm that, that this thin conductive layer was actually overburned. So we looked at the base of bedrock information from, from all of these other data sources and compared. So that's basically what these sections are where we were able to compare the, the conductivity models against, to, um, against uh, existing data to sort of validate what we were about to do, which was interpret conductive cover from these sections. So these, um, you can see these well derricks here. These are um, exploration drill holes, and the the red spheres are the base of the cover. So here, this was a good place where we were, we, we had a bunch of exploration drill holes, and we were able to sort of confirm that that there's a good correlation here between the the base of overburden from this drill holes and the uh, the base of the conductive cover. And we had other information too. We had water well data there's a lot of water well data in british columbia which also contains so this is the minimum thickness or bedrock um the water well uh, logs are are somewhat inconsistent and a little bit hard to um to um 
sort of validate the the um, accuracy of but so there is still consistency between the minimum thickness from the water wells and the um, conductive cover the black the black spheres are are is my interpretation so um so that was where i was interpreting the base of the cover and then the green are the, the minimum thickness from the water wells and we also had outcrop information so obviously wherever there's outcrop um there should be no conductive cover in the in the v10 inversion so the red dots here are where um, there was outcrop mapped and you can see here there's no there's no um, thin conductive layer here and so we actually took that as well so in the inversions we we actually also interpreted where there was likely no cover where so the areas where it's just blue like this we did did some in point interpretations okay no there's likely no cover here no cover here and we also use that as a constraint for our thickness models so the modeling so there was good coverage like i said already from other data and so this map shows the green circles are water well data it's a huge amount of water well data that's publicly available and the pink diamonds are outcrop so we had all this outcrop so that's the, there's you know no overburden there presumably or little and mo many of these water wells will tell you where bedrock where it's hit bedrock and in some cases you have a minimum thickness it hasn't hit bedrock but you know there's still cover and there's been some modeling that was previously done using these constraints so what we did was add the interpretations from the vtem inversions and that actually added a huge amount of constraints to the um, for the thickness modeling. So adding that VTEM information in. So now you see all these sort of stripes here. That's every VTEM inversion line. And the, the, these are basically really, really tiny dots where, where there's been an interpretation of that thin conductive overburden. So we were able to fill in a lot of the space. <clears throat> And then the black circles are where there was no conductive um, overburden, so little to no uh, cover. So our, our outcome, the overburden thickness model, <clears throat> and eventually this model, so it was used in two regards. One was to constrain the magnetic and gravity inversions. So we were able to set that layer in the inversions as overburden. And then we also use it to obviously assess the exploration and mining potential. So this is just a little zoom in area of that. And again, this is a pretty local result um, for people that are exploring here. But I'll just point out a few things that the thickest um, area was uh, the thickest overboard was about 400 meters. And uh, there was a few areas where it was quite thick. And in general, the 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 magnetic targets that we picked, about um, 47 out of 57 of them were under, um, on average, 60 meters of overburden. So not completely inaccessible things. There were about eight, I think, that were over, um, that had over 100 meters of overburden above them. So not too many with, with a, a, a lot of overburden sitting on top. So that was an interesting result. Um, one really neat thing you can see here is these dark brown polygons <clears throat> that represents this is the regional um, mapped extent of overburden from the BC Geological Survey. And you can see this correlates in a lot of places where where the overburden is thin in our model. So the thin the thin overburden is these like really pale areas here. That's where it's thin. <clears throat> you can see on the scale here. So we, we got a good correlation. This these polygons were not used in the in the uh, interpretation so there's good correlation where they've mapped it to be thin sorry these these are windows um windows uh, to bedrock basically you can look at them as and there's a good correlation where we have very thin cover and then there's some areas where there was previously no constraints or very few and i can just go back you can see here this is one of the areas where there's very few constraints previously probably a difficult to access or more difficult to access area. And we were able to fill in that with some VTEM. And so now you can see in this area, we've got some more information. And in fact, there's some areas that have pretty thin cover. 
so that might be useful for not just porphyry exploration, but um, mapping geology, understanding um, the geology of the area. <clears throat> so going back to the, the geophysics, the last thing we did with the geophysics was invert the, the magnetic and gravity data so that we could determine what the magnetic susceptibilities and densities of each of the targets are so that we can compare them to what we understand to be um, the signatures of porphyry intrusions, um, post rocks, intrusive post rocks. So if you don't, if you haven't heard of in geophysical inversion before, I just put this slide up to really, really simply show what, what that means. And it's basically, <clears throat> You have an, a, an observed geophysical data set. And in this example, this is one of our targets. This is magnetic data. And you're trying to estimate what, or trying to find what the model is that explains that data. So what, mo what model causes that data, what model of the earth? And this is the, this is, in this case, this was the model that was derived. It's a susceptibility model. And it's actually, um, so it could be gravity and a density model. And it's, it's really non-trivial. Um, that was a really basic explanation, just in case you haven't heard the term before. And, um, but it's, there, there, you know, there's a lot of model parameters that need to be considered in geophysical inversion and model rules. And, and um, I was really happy to have um, Devin Cowan and Thibaut Astic do this inversion work for this project. Um, they, worked really hard at it and uh, did a lot of trials and tests on this um, on inverting this data to get it to be uh, to get the, the best models out of it as possible. But but ultimately it's these you can you get the best models when you when you get your geologists working with your geophysicists and and um, so that in the end you've got a model that makes both geological sense and, and mathematical sense. So it's important to work together to, to um, get the best models possible. So I've got the GIF symbol there. That's Devin Cowan and Tivo Astic um, were part of GIF when they were when they were working on this. So this is our inversion results. Got 56 magnetic inversions. So this is a horizontal look uh, plan section plan view of the the inversions. What, for one of the targets we didn't have uh, we didn't have the data and so we end up with 56 inversions out of the 57 targets and then we've got um four inversions from the gravity data so this is we did a more intermediate scale of inversion for gravity because the data is is coarser and it just was more better represented at uh, the scale of inversion so we've got fairly detailed information from the magnetics and more coarse information from the gravity so doing those inversions allowed us to get sort of these petrophysical profiles of each of the targets. And this image here shows the density model, a horizontal slice through the density model. And then the targets as they were modeled from using magnetic inversion. And <clears throat> so these bodies represent a 20 times 10 to the negative three SI isosurface. So that was the cutoff susceptibility value that we use to isolate the, the, the magnetic bodies that are causing these, these um, um, positive magnetic anomalies. <clears throat> and then we colored them based on their sort of, um, so their average density, a sort of their density profile. So the blues, the ones that are colored blue are low density and then yellows are moderate density and reds are high density and then dark reds are very high density <laughs> and um if you go back or remember me talking about the the densities of the intrusive rocks and that they increase as you move toward rocks that contain more iron magnesium minerals you might be able to <clears throat> consider these low density things as being something that is has a lower density mineral content or minerals that are lower density overall. So 
they may be cyanitic or or granitic or monzonitic or things that have less um, iron magnesium minerals overall and then as you get to the higher density ones these may be more um, granodiuretic monzodiuretic diuretic in nature and then some of them are quite high density and they might even be a, a, a gabbro or something like that um, and what we did was compile these tables per area and I wouldn't say ranked, but just sorted them in order from higher to lower density and basically did this because if you remember, <clears throat> most of the porphyry host rocks in the southern Cornell terrain were higher, moderate to higher density. So this is this is a reasoning sort of behind this sorting. So these are the ones at the top that are most like the intrusive hosts in the southern Cornell terrain. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then these are less like the ones that are lower density. And then, of course, there are other things to consider. So in these tables, we also included the overburden thickness that was modeled over each of these targets. And other features of note. So then you start looking at <clears throat> aerial imagery and things like that and and identifying, you know, there are things that hinder alteration, uh, alter, uh, exploration in some of these places like rivers, towns, there's First Nations reserves, there's um, lakes. Uh, things like that. Obviously, we went into this picking targets without looking at any of those other things. So we compile this information in these tables to point out some of the things that we saw that uh, might make a have an influence on where you're going to go explore which targets you're going to pick. And then again, this is quite local. Th these are just the other um, areas uh, that we worked in the, the Prince George block and the Quinell block. And in the Prince George area, we have mostly moderate to um, high density magnetic targets. And some of them, or many of them actually sit on a, um, on a discrete uh, density anomaly or gravity anomaly. So those are quite interesting to me. They're, they have a nice discrete density or gravity anomaly and they're, and they're magnetic. They seem very intrusion-like to me. And then, although in southern Prince George area, some of these have interference with, with roads and rivers and things like that. And then in the southern Quinell area, again, there's a mostly moderate to um, higher density things. But in this case, it's a little bit tricky because a lot of these sit on the edges of these anomalies. So they're actual densities that were extracted from the or average from the inversion might be might not be correct because they're sort of in these in these sort of edge areas but what's interesting is <clears throat> in in the southern quenelle here there are a lot of seem to be a lot of high density um basalts basaltic rocks and i i believe that these sort of um <clears throat> linear density features are massive high density basalt units mm -hmm. And it looks like a lot of these do sit sort of on the edges of these things. So it's possible that there's sort of structural controls on um, some of these, what we've interpreted to be um, intrusions. Okay, so implications. Um, so one thing is a host lithology. Um, uh, in, one, in one case, you know, we've come up with the, the idea that um, maybe you know, monzonitic rock or cyanitic rocks are less dense and, and, and um, diuretic rocks are more dense. And, um, and so maybe that's going to help us in our explorations if we can identify rock type from density. That would be really neat because then we might have an idea of what alteration mineral products might form of the alteration of these host rocks. And so maybe this is my arm wavy bit. <laughs> maybe we can take it a step further. So there's actually two, two defined types of alkalic uh, porphyries. One is a silica undersaturated alkalic porphyry. And one is a, um, sorry, one's a silica undersaturated, one is a silica saturated. And that just has to do with the amount of alkali minerals versus uh, silica. And so I'm wondering if we can distinguish whether we have one of these types versus the other uh, based on, on density. I'm being very arm wavy right now, <laughs> but because um, <clears throat> I don't have a lot of data on this, but it might be fun to do more work and try to figure this type of thing out. But if you start at the bottom of this table here, 
Mount Milligan, Afton, we talked about Ajax, Copper Mountain. These are, were all the ones in the Southern Quinell terrain. Silica saturated um, to transitional silica saturated to undersaturated. And these were all moderate to high density anomalies. Okay, so then we have Mount Pauly, which I pointed out was a bit broke from the broke from the trend. And it had seemed to have a low of gravity low associated with it. It has more cyanide there. So that was what kind of what, how I explained that away. Okay, now moving up into the silica undersaturated um, hosts and deposits, um, the Rayfield Rivers is more of a, um, an occurrence, a porphyry occurrence. Silica undersaturated, it's in the Southern Quinell terrain, it's a gravity low. So the other two, Galore Creek and Lorraine, I didn't, I didn't mention, um, it's sort of out of the project area. But then I was curious because I, I wanted to see, oh, I would expect maybe they're going to be gravity lows as well because they're silica undersaturated. They're, they've got lots of cyanite. And so I was expecting maybe we can pick out these cyanitic things with gravity lows and or silica undersaturated things. So first I looked at Galore Creek. Um, this is just the, you know, the greens are the volcanic units and the, the pinks and oranges are the intrus intrusives. And so this is the intrusive host rock for Galore Creek, silica undersaturated, alcalic porphyry. And then I got the gravity and this is this very coarse <laughs> gravity set, data set for Canada, which is, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to come to a conclusion on this one, <laughs> I'm going to admit. Um, but, you know, maybe it's a low, it's, it's too coarse to tell, but it'd be great to get, I don't know, maybe it's some higher density or higher uh, resolution gravity data exists, but I, and I'd like to see it. I, I would assume that it would be a low. <clears throat> Hard to tell with this data. Okay, now Lorraine, again, it's it's hosted in the, the Duckling Creek cyanate. So it's a silica undersaturated setting. And I expect it to be <clears throat> uh, gravity low. And luckily in this area, we've the, the Geoscience BC Quest data covers it. So we've got some higher gravity data. So this is the Lorraine basically the main mineralized area in here is in red and then the big purple is the, the duckling creek cyanate so this is interesting so when i looked at the gravity there's this big high <clears throat> but but this dark purple here is a peroxinite so some of these silica undersaturated things have peroxinite um cyanite and peroxinite and in fact at lorraine we've got a lot of peroxinite and the gravity high seems to sit right over that this i've outlined the peroxinitic area so the cyanitic part of it is low as it has a gravity lowers low density and then the peroxinitic part is higher density um so i guess i guess what i would i would it'd be fun to go and collect more rock property data on on all of these um intrusive host rocks and and have more gravity data to to look at and sort of come up with more conclusions on this but so just my speculations and and interesting things to follow up <clears throat> so scale um that's another implication here and something that i should point out is um the scale of this work was was sort of district regional scale um anomalies that represent intrusive host rocks so the I'm, I'm missing my map here, but the the dark outline here is essentially the Mount Polly intrusion. And then these are the pits. So these are the mineralized areas. So if you look at the scale difference there, we're looking at five kilometers for the intrusion and 500 to 500 meters to a kilometer scale for the actual mineralization zones. Same with Copper Mountain. There's a big intrusive, intrusive um, I would call it like a host rock or a source rock possibly that's 10 kilometers across. And then there's these one kilometer or 500 meter size mineralized zones. So just to kind of understand the scale difference of these, these targets that we've picked out and, and then the actual mineralized zones um, are, are much, much smaller. So um, again, this is New Afton. This is just the tail end of the intrusion here in orange. And then you've got the new Afton um, pit, the pothook pit, again, small. 
compared to the size of the intrusion. So it's a really important thing to take away. And, and also an important thing is that a lot of times these um, mineralized areas occur on the edges of these. So in terms of where to explore these targets, edges or, or internal contacts between phases and things like that, where fluid flow is, is higher in the porphyry, during porphyry formation, porphyry um, mineralization. <clears throat> and so just to kind of conclude future work here, it'd be nice to go and look a little bit more at what this, these spatial correlations are between um, the different intrusive events. Is there a structural control, a deep structural control on these? Are there transverse arc perpendicular structures, kind of like in Chile, where they control these, the porphyry deposit locations there? and then looking up into the central Cornell ter terrain, the project area. Are we seeing anything like that? Is this sort of like a cluster and this a cluster related to um, our parallel deep crustal structures? It would be interesting to look more into that. With the VTEM data, as I mentioned before, there's, there's so much more that can be done. There's lots of information. You can actually see geology in, the, in those inversions. Um, another really cool thing that some people have been doing is, is um, determining chargeability from the, the VTEM data. And it also seems to pick out geology, which is really cool. It picks out some of the inversions and I think, uh, not inversions, uh, intrusions. And I think they're chargeable because of their, um, their magnetite or something, something about them um, disseminated um, oxides and things like that that might be causing chargeability. So that's another tool that could help us map geology. And of course, rock properties, uh, the porphyry host rocks would be ni nice to put together a better story about, um, can we determine um, in, in um, porphyry host lithology from magnetic and gravity data? And, and we can try to start to unravel that by looking at rock properties. So collecting more data there. <clears throat> um, so this is my last slide. I just, just like to ask, please consult with First Nations prior to any mineral exploration work and, this or any other jurisdiction following on these studies or any time you explore. Um, just a few more acknowledgements. Again, Geoscience BC, thank you so much. Uh, Sean Barker, the director of MDRU. Um, Baram Najafian, um, he did so much of the um, um, lab uh, rock sample prep and, and analyses uh, for this project. My other MDRU colleagues. Um, and Randy Ankin at the Geological Survey of Canada did the rock property measurements for this project. UBC GIF, I mean, when you work with one of these uh, UBC GIF people, uh, Devin or Thibault, you get, you get the whole group, which is just amazing. <laughs> and you get input from all sorts of people. It's just, it's, it's so great working with them. And also the reviewers for the final report for this project. Um, thank you. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dayan. That was amazing. <laughs> so we got a pretty good audience today. If you guys have any questions, please leave them in the chat box. And the new one can help us to go through the question. So let's get the first one. <laughs> uh, that was an interesting part. Um, would you like to? Unmute your circuit and go for it. This is Nick Arndt. I don't know if you were asking me. I just sent in a, ch a question in the chat. So Diane, I put it there. But the, basically the question is, um, have you considered using passive seismic methods at all, which work very well for mapping cover, cover thickness, covered variations in cover thickness, and also... Um, might be able to distinguish the different lithologies that are the different type, might be able to image the intrusions that seem to be important in, in controlling the mineralization. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, you brought up the same thing that Sean brought up to me when I was writing this report about the passive seismic. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I. I think that would be really cool. I, I don't know if there's any plans by um, the government or or um, or any other groups or Geoscience BC to do anything like um, that with the passive seismic, but I, I understand that it's really good for that. <clears throat> I know that I've heard that people, you know, 
companies are, do that on their, for their own purposes um, to map the overburden in their, in their specific areas that they're planning on drilling and things like that. And it will be really cool to see. Um, and yeah, the lithologies, I mean, even with the, um, the VTEM is, I just, I just want to really want to dig into the VTEM so much because in the process of interpreting the overburden, um, I just, you know, I could tell I was seeing resistive intrusions in that thing. And, and they did match up with mapped things in some places and other places. No. And that was really neat, but um, the passive seismic um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not very familiar with passive seismic or seismic methods and, um, and yeah, it would be neat to see if you could see the pull ge extra geology out of that as well, and just start to line up um, interpretations from different from different sources. I mean, there's yeah, like I said, there's lots, so much data there, and I think all it, really it's just time and and uh, for for people to dig into, and a lot of people in the exploration industry don't have that time, and 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 luckily, I mean, I was able to pursue this um and and have a bit of time to put into it but i love to have more and or or love to see somebody um pursue some of these other uh avenues okay look thanks i'll put a link in the chat where you can get more information oh great thank you okay, okay thank you nick so hallelujah would you like to go for the next question uh Great time and for a, a great talk. It's not a question, it's rather a comment from Jerry and I would like Jerry to unmute so they can just say their comment out. I think it's a very good comment. So Jerry, can you please unmute and just say out your comment? Yeah, it's, uh, hi Diane. Uh, you know, having uh, sort of worked through some of these data sets in their earlier manifestations decades ago, uh, I know how the answer is often conditioned by the uh, resolution of the data that you're starting with. So uh, just in particular, gravity is, if I recall the Sanders survey specs uh, reasonably, I think their spatial resolution was on the order of two to three kilometers. So, uh, you know, that can tend to uh, blur the response from many local aspects related to the mineralization. Yeah, I completely, completely agree with that. And when um, <clears throat> Jevin and Thibaut, Thibaut was actually the one that was uh, inverting the gravity data and tried so many things to just <laughs> to tease out details and information from, from that data. And, and ultimately, it, it's a very, fairly smooth data set. And it, it is what it is. And it's hard to get, it's hard to get, um, fine scale detail out of it, but it does tell you things. There's information in it. And especially when you compare it to the VTEM, there's, co there's correlations between the gravity and VTEM uh, data sets and inversions and, and the, mag the magnetics and gravity are, are, are kind of funny. They don't seem to correlate as, as well, but it's just because they're seeing different things, I think. But, uh, but yeah, the gravity is pr pretty core. So some of these, um, some of these conclusions with the gravity um, obviously could use probably could use more higher resolution gravity data, but it's a start, I think. And, and um, for sure, some of these anomalies, the gravity anomalies are, are clear. And in other cases, it is, there's no clear correlation. It's not a good correlation with the, the magnetic um, anomalies we're seeing. Hi, Diane. One of the best ways to go about it is satellite gravity. <clears throat> because you've got uniform coverage as opposed to spatially limited coverage from the, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, the stomach stuff that's available. Good talk. Thank you. Yeah. I, I haven't used the satellite gra gravity. Maybe you could tell me a little bit more about what is it? What is it like resolution wise? Oh, <laughs> I'll ship you, I'll ship, I'll ship you something. Okay. <laughs> Thanks Bill. So let's see if we have any more questions So I'm just wondering, Diane. Uh, okay, this is like a vegetable cover kind of area. <laughs> <Very Yeah. difficult laughs> to what I'm facing in egg bottom. So it's really, really challenging. And there's pretty much not too many outcrops out there. 
So what would happen if we end up somewhere without vegetation? Like some part of the world that uh, pretty much the cover is something like sand or gravel or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really know for sure. I think this, in some ways, the same things will apply. Um, you know, the magnetics and gravity, if you use those techniques, um, you, you, you could, they would, they'll help you map geology through mm -hmm. any kind of cover, I'm assuming, unless it's like something that interferes a lot, unless the covers interferes a lot with the response, if the cover is really magnetic, which is kind of rare, and, um, or if the cover is very oddly dense, which is also really rare. Um, but, um, yeah, so those things will still work. The things that might change are the, the VTEM. Um, I don't know what it what it would do with cover different cover material. It, I mean, it just so happens in that area, the cover material is conductive and it's probably partly because of its you know, saturation with water and, um, and the material itself. And <clears throat> I don't fully understand um, you know, what makes it conductive, but um, and I'm not sure if in other parts of the world, the, the world that cover would have the same physical properties in terms of electrical properties. But yeah, some of those things would work and other things um, may, maybe not in the same way. But then also, also like I said, this, this is a very um, particular kind of porphyry deposit <laughs> and, and uh, it's not found in a lot of places. That's the other thing you, you need to consider. And I guess my um my message usually is you know um data exploration um find out what seems to work you know explore the data that you have take some time to explore the data that you have because that's that's the only reason why we you know we went down the path we did because we saw some patterns pattern recognition and that's the kind of stuff that i really love and, and i think geologists really love in general and you know, I mean, any, any geologist would just, you know, would love to have time to just play with data and, and sit with data in front of them and just look for patterns and things like that. So, yeah, this is a particular kind of mineral deposit and it won't be, won't be the same techniques used to find those, to find rocks for other porphyry deposits may, maybe, but spending time with the data and just looking for patterns and recognizing what works at different scales you know, of course, when you change scale, it's going to change as well. But, <clears throat> but this seems to be because fairly consistent patterns in this part of British Columbia, and and um, a lot of times porphyry host rocks are have magnetite or oxidize and have magnetite, so magnetics mm -hmm. usually does work good. Um, density might change from place to place. It's a funny property, but um, but yeah. Okay, so if you are facing with a uh, high depth system, uh, how much reliable uh, these techniques are going to be? Oops, sorry. So what what system? <clears throat> uh, the high depth mineralization system. Oh, um, something something mm -hmm. really deep. Yep. Mm. Oh, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, um. <laughs> That's a tricky part when it comes to geophysics, right? You <laughs> and you yeah. do not get that. Yeah, well, these, these, these um, you know, I never showed in detail the, what these bodies are, you know, in terms of size, but they're, they're, they're large. I mean, they're go the ones that we've resolved. And, and of course, like, I, we've chosen a cutoff, a threshold of you know, a certain susceptibility, 20 times 10 to the negative three SI and that makes a certain size body. If I chose a different value, you know, so it would be a different size in the model. So again, like this is another, um, um, you know, thing that this is based on a rock property knowledge. We chose this cutoff and we think that represents the extent of that intrusion, but it might not represent it accurately because we've chosen some cutoff and, and it might not represent it everywhere but the bodies are you know they're quite large and when you look at them compared to like some of the drilling the drills are pretty you know the drill holes are pretty short compared to these fairly like five kilometer 10 kilometer bodies that we're resolving so if there's a mineralized system that's 
at, at depth somewhere around the edge of this thing or within that thing. Yeah, it would be hard to, it would be hard to sort of know about unless you're doing, you know, you're developing that property, I guess I would imagine. It would be pretty local scale at that point before you understand you have something deep. You'd have probably done a lot of drilling already and, and, and other geochemical exploration around it or, or other local, probably local uh, geophysical surveys. Okay, okay, got it. Great, thank you. So it looks like we don't have any more questions, but if anybody got something for, for further discussion with me, they are just go for it. <laughs> and I would like to thank everybody for being with us, specifically Diane, it was an amazing talk. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're gonna see you in upcoming two. Have a good one, everybody. Cheers.